Um, well, we're not going to talk about so much about the, the Dutch music itself. I am going to show a couple of examples of Dutch musicians who do very well uh, outside of the Netherlands. Um, let me first start by uh, saying why there are so many uh, logos on the slide. Uh, this research project is part of the Amsterdam Creative Industries Center of Expertise. I'll tell a little bit about that uh, in a while. Uh, we also uh, partner up uh, with Buma Stemra, which is the Dutch Collecting Rights Society, uh, and Buma Kultuur, who, who also uh, um, is the organization behind Eurosonic Noorderslag, uh, Amsterdam Dance Event, and promotes Dutch music abroad. Um, the, the left one for you, or is it the right one? Right one, left one for me. Um, that's perfect and more. It's a consultancy uh, agency who performs the export value study annually in, uh, uh, to look what the, what the financial value of Dutch music abroad is. Okay, to start with the first one, the Amsterdam Creative Industry Center. Am I okay there? Yeah. Um, it's a collaboration between three universities of applied sciences. HBO, as we say in the Netherlands, or Hochschule, I believe is the uh, correct equivalent here in uh, Germany. Uh, it's all within the greater Amsterdam region, and it is uh, uh, applied research on the creative industries. Um, it has established about a year ago, and uh, we want to be the meeting place for knowledge on the creative industries uh, for three partners, for business, for government, and for, for us, the researchers and also try and get uh, education involved, so students actually work on, on uh, the research projects. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is a project that came out of uh, this ongoing research about the export value of uh, Dutch popular music. That is an annual report. It has been commissioned by Buma Kultuur. Uh, as I said, uh, these are the people that promote Dutch music abroad. Uh, they're usually at this type of conferences uh, all around the world, so meet them south by southwest, etc., promoting and pushing Dutch artists, uh, try to get them uh, uh, to perform and uh, touch Dutch base in uh, different countries. Uh, the goal of the export value research is to map the export value of Dutch popular music, so how much uh, money does it equal what Dutch musicians do abroad. It's an ongoing research project and there is an annual report. Um, to be precise, what is Dutch popular music? Um, Siep Kruske, who is the, the main researcher for that study, uh, and is our colleague as well at the university, uh, he came up with four different criteria. So these are either Dutch composer or composers or lyricists, so copyright owners. Um, it can also be music performed by Dutch musicians. Um, maybe some of you are aware that Jaya the Cat uh, is a band, a ska, a rock band, that has also Dutch musicians in them. Um, so that's regardless of the nationality of the copyright owners, Dutch musicians. Um, it can also be the Netherlands as a country of residence of the publisher as a copyright owner, or the country of residence for the producer of the recording. So in that case, he talks about country of signing. He distinguishes between three main categories of value creation. Uh, first one being copyrights. Recordings, uh, that can be in any type, and live performance. I'm going to uh, quickly walk you through uh, the figures, the most recent figures. These are the figures for 2012. These were presented uh, uh, this January at the Eurosonic Noorderslag uh, uh, Festival. Um, the sources here, uh, down below as well, if you go on to the if, uh, Buma Kultur website, you can check the full report if you're interested. It is in Dutch though. Um, that's why I translated a couple of things here. Uh, so here's the, the total value. Uh, you see the, the subtotal of rights. Just to make sure, uh, Buma is the collecting society for mechanical rights, Stemra for performing rights, and Sena for neighboring rights. I won't go into all the details, but I assume most of you are uh, aware what all these rights are. Um, then there's recordings, and as you will see, uh, the major uh, selling of recordings, that's by dance labels. Um, then indies and majors, and also a little bit of the so-called foreign signings. Um, the majority of the export value comes from the live industry, um, so the bottom part. 
Altogether, in 2012, the export value of Dutch music amounted to uh, uh, roughly uh, 130 million euros. He also uh, likes to uh, keep track of trends. Um, as you will see here, if you compare 2010 and 2011, uh, there's a 20% uh, growth in export value. And uh, between 2010 and 2011, uh, the American market opened up to electronic dance music. And as you all know, there's quite a couple of dance producers coming from the Netherlands who do really, really well all over the world. Uh, and the main increase that you see there comes from exactly that. So the dance, and you also see it in the, in the uh, table there, dance raises from 48 million to 64 million, and even uh, to 87 million in uh, 2012. Well, I won't go very much into detail. Uh, I just wanted to show a couple of trends. As you can see, Dutch music export is doing really well. It's really growing. And this is the total amount. Uh, we're talking about a million euros there. Um, here are the trends for rides. I hope you can all see the colors there. The blue line is mechanical rides. That's, uh, uh, that's rising, increasing. Then the red one, the red dotted line, is performing rides. And green is neighboring rides. Again, if I'm going too fast, uh, you can download the report. And these graphs are uh, pretty straightforward although the rest of the report is in Dutch. Um, if we talk about recordings, uh, again, we see already starting in 2005, uh, well, already starting in 2004, the rise of electronic dance music and uh, the decrease in export or uh, sales of recordings uh, for the major labels. As you see, there's a, it's a rather going up and down for dance labels. Uh, but altogether, there's a big increase in how much money is coming in uh, from abroad. Um, well, yeah, then there's, of course, also the other. That's anything else uh, uh, besides the majors or uh, dance music. And the foreign signings, that's a rather uh, almost a straight line. Um, then the trends. Uh, well, here are the figures. Um, I won't go over them in detail. But this is really the major growth market, live, and especially live for dance music. As you can see, it's really going through the roof there. So who are these artists then? I hope you can all read this. Is this readable in the back as well? Yes, okay, good to hear. So Rehab, Chucky Hardwell, Laidback Luke, Afrojack, Bingo Players, all dance producers, and you see the, the, the figures on the, let me see, so that's your right hand side, yeah. Um, rehab, he performed 190 times per year outside of the Netherlands. And that can also include, he did multiple uh, 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 performances on one evening as well. So that's how he got to so many uh, gigs. Um, and on the, let me think again, uh, left hand side for you in the table, uh, that's, their, that's their position. So in 2010, uh, Rehab was not uh, doing anything within this report, so no, he was not in the top 50. He, he came in uh, in 2011 where he had position number 10, and in 2012 he had position number 1. And that's how you have to read this table. Okay, again, um, this is the expert value when you look at recordings, at rights, and uh, uh, live performance. But the big problem that SIP is facing is that he is not able to track exactly uh, the online business models. Um, just a couple of quotes from industry reports why uh, digital income uh, online uh, business models are becoming really important. IFPI uh, uh, report, worldwide the digital market in 2012 was responsible 34% of the total turnover. Uh, with an estimated turnover of $5.6 billion, the digital market grew by 9% more compared to 2011. Uh, MVPE, which is the Dutch uh, version of IFPI, uh, in 2013 the total turnover of Dutch record industry, and we're only talking about recordings here, so not even live, uh, amounted to just over 130 million euros. 40.16 of the turnover came from the digital market, an increase of almost 20%. 
uh, again, IFPI. In 2012, there were more than 500 licensed digital music services, which together offered 30 million tracks to the public worldwide. In other words, digital music consumption has become mainstream. Okay, now on to our study. I must say, this is ongoing research, and uh, later on we're going to uh, uh, present some of our preliminary findings. Um, so, we're also here to hear from you. I don't know uh, who's exactly in the crowd. Are there music uh, uh, businesses here? Raise your hand, please. Are there musicians themselves also in the crowd? Yes, excellent. Uh, people from educational research? Okay, at least a lot of people who haven't raised their hands, so curious to find out who you are. Um, our research goals, uh, we want to map the online income streams for the Dutch music. That's basically our main goal. Uh, so not really uh, saying anything about uh, strategy up front, but our first goal is to map what is going on because it's not uh, insightful now. So develop a research method to track this, so not only this year, but to keep on tracking that as part of the expert value study and also relate the findings of online business models to the already existing expert value study. To give an example, uh, if you have a, a, an artist like a DJ performing in, in Russia, is he also making more money uh, via social media or via uh, the streaming channels in Russia? Um, related to this is of course also uh, advice to uh, policy makers, uh, also to Buma Kultur on how to promote Dutch music more effectively and even strategy uh, advice for uh, music companies and musicians, how to do this in an efficient, efficient way. Uh, I'll quickly go over the research question. So what are the online business models? What is the role of social media? How can we track this? Uh, can we relate uh, online income to online presence? Meaning you have uh, direct income models online, but you also have online presence uh, through social media, YouTube, etc. Uh, whereas YouTube is actually also some sort of hybrid model, because on the one hand it's presence, it's uh, showing who you are, but you can also, uh, we learned that yesterday also, uh, from the lady from YouTube uh, telling you uh, how to make money uh, with your own YouTube channel. Um, related to that, how can we see uh, what you're making offline? Does that relate to anything you do online? And uh, what's really interesting that we also want to see, uh, are there differences for different genres? So is metal more present in, let's say, uh, eastern part of Europe or uh, in uh, South America? And uh, what is dance doing compared to metal or uh, indie pop? Where are they uh, present on? Um, as you will see later on, Spina will uh, show the pilot study for social media presence. Uh, we did a really uh, uh, small scale pilot study, but there we already see some really interesting differences for different artists. So they are using different channels to put out their uh, music. Um, so yeah, that's what uh, uh, Sabina will tell you in a minute. And so the pilot study. We're also conducting expert interviews, people who have extensive, uh, uh, um, uh, how to say, uh, erfaring, uh, experience within the music industry. Uh, we want to talk with some of the managers and musicians themselves. How are they tackling this problem? What are they doing? Are they tracking their online presence? Are they tracking who their uh, followers, users, etc. are? What are they doing with this data? Uh, we want to see if we can find a way uh, for all the publicly available data on social media to uh, come up with a, with a way of measuring that for all of the Dutch uh, music industry. I'm saying all of it, but uh, that probably will relate to all the uh, musicians uh, and artists that are uh, followed within the uh, uh, expert value report annually. We want to look at online sales and we want to look at streaming income. Um, and uh, last but not least, we want to do a case study of several example artists. And the, as the pilot study shows, uh, there can be quite some interesting conclusion be drawn from that, that type of case study. Okay, so then mapping the online business models. Uh, and this is basically our theoretical uh, uh, context of the, of the research. Uh, I don't think it will be very surprising to you because I believe that you probably all know what I'm going to tell now. Quickly uh, walk you through the old music industry into the new music industry. Really basic, there's music, the artist, is, artist or songwriter, there are intermediaries such as record labels, and then there's the audience. 
And as you can see from the arrows, it used to be rather top down. To make it a little bit more complicated, there's live sales and rides. Um, and they reach their audience through promotion and publicity. Radio, television, print, media. A uh, little bit of insight on the rides. Uh, won't say too much about it there. What is important here, this is uh, how we sketch the old business model. Uh, which is mainly a linear model going from music, uh, record label, promotion, audience. Or concert promoter, publicity, promotion, audience. Uh, the only thing that we could think of is that you also had like stuff like fan clubs, fan scenes, even fan mail, which was more or less the only way of uh, giving feedback from the audience to the musician. As you see nowadays, the digital era, the new business model is much more circular. There is interaction, not only in terms of uh, the way that the money goes, because uh, there is ways of fan funding, so there's ways for the audience to directly uh, put in money to their artists they like, but also uh, think about remixes or mashups or any other way that people also play with the music from the artists. So also music is going in, in lots of different directions. Um, we use the term intermediaries here because it's much more than uh, within the old model. I mean, there are record labels, publisher, concert promoters in the old, in the old uh, one, but uh, in comes YouTube, in comes iTunes, in comes Spotify, all sorts of new intermediaries who are uh, doing different things for musicians to get their music across to the audience. Uh, we came up with more or less six different business models or categor categories of business models. Uh, there's crowdfunding, which you, in a way you can also say that uh, uh, fan subscription models, uh, which I saw earlier today, uh, is also a way of some sort of crowdfunding. Uh, there's online sales, of course. You can think of uh, the fiscal carriers, so CDs, uh, uh, records that are being uh, uh, sold through Amazon. Uh, there's the download, so uh, that's MP3s. Uh, and of course, mer merchandise is also a, a large income stream online sales. Well, there's the rights. There's streaming, and we divide between audio video streaming. You got on-demand streaming, broadcast streaming. You got paid streaming and free streaming. And social media. And What's interesting here is that there's also an additional way of making money there. If you have social media, uh, you can also through, uh, for example, YouTube, you can uh, sell advertising space or attention. We are not quite sure how to use it, but there's something there. There's a relationship between the artist and their audience, and that relationship also represents a certain value that can be monetized upon. Uh, same for online sales. If you have a web shop, you can also put ads there. And then there's online promotion and publicity. We also want to uh, pay attention to the notion of uh, if you have, a, there, there are loads of loads of uh, review blogs or uh, people writing about music. That is also online promotion and publicity. Okay, I'm going to hand over the microphone to Sabine, who's going to say something about the social media pilot study. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to tell something about the pilot study we did to explore ways of measuring online presence and to discover what kind of data we could find uh, by looking at profiles of different artists. So we looked at uh, uh, data that is publicly available so for everyone to see. And uh, first, I'm going to tell something about the social media metrics uh, which we used uh, to measure this online presence. And uh, secondly, I will uh, uh, talk you through some results um, of the pilot study. And uh, uh, I will end uh, by uh, showing some examples of measuring online reputation. Um, okay, so we had to find a way to measure online presence. Uh, so we looked at some models and uh, the starting point of this social media scan uh, is the four-phase model by Don Bartholomew. And in this model, uh, four phases of metrics are discerned and in each stage, uh, interaction between uh, the content that is put on uh, online and social media users is intensified. So we can see 
the first box is, uh, is about exposure. To what degree have we created exposure to content and message? And that basically means uh, how many people are reached uh, through social media sites, websites, uh, and, and other platforms. The second box is about, the second phase is about engagement. Uh, who is interacting and engaging with our content and how and where? So, um, what do people with, uh, with the content? And uh, the third uh, box is about influence, the, the third stage. So, how we influence perceptions and attitudes uh, of the target, which means uh, what do users say and think about you, the artist? Uh, and that has to do with ongoing sentiment online. Are they positive or are there negative reactions? So, that's what influence is. Um, and these three stages, are, uh, they have non-financial impact. They can uh, uh, enlarge your social for online presence and online reputation, uh, uh, but they have uh, no financial impact. And the fourth phase is the action phase. So what actions, if any, uh, has the target taken? And uh, that is where we see there's possible uh, financial impact or return on investment. So uh, are people actually purchasing albums or concert tickets uh, or other, other merchandising, uh, for example? Um, so does something come back to you financially? Uh, that's the fourth stage. Um, in our pilot study, we concentrated on the first two stages, or the first two phases, the exposure and engagement phase, uh, because uh, the action phase we, we can't measure because we don't have that data. We have to know uh, uh, how much money is made, um, and we don't. So uh, we didn't study uh, that in this pilot study. Okay, well, when we look at exposure, we can look at number of followers, likes, subscribers, members, fans, views, or visits. And that's only about the reach of the content. Um, and when we look at engagement, uh, we used Kaushik's social media metrics uh, to measure engagement. And um, we can look at the conversation rate, which means uh, the number of reactions or replies, the applause rate, which uh, is the number of likes and favorites, the amplification rate, which is the number of shares and retweets. Uh, and we uh, looked at this per post. And the fourth is the economic value, which is the same as the action phase uh, or the return on investment. Okay, well, we looked at three different artists and how, uh, uh, how their online presence uh, and their online presence. Um, these three Dutch artists are internationally successful in their genre. We took three different genres. And um, maybe someone saw it, but um, the first band we looked at is Epica, and it was in the number 20 of the list. It, I believe it was the first uh, 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 act uh, who isn't a dance act. So Epica is an, uh, uh, a symphonic metal band, uh, internationally popular, uh, quite a vast fan base, and uh, they released their sixth album, sixth album during, uh, during our scan. So there was quite a lot going on at that time. Um, the second band we looked at was I Am Oak, which is an alternative band uh, formed around a singer-songwriter. Um, they have modest international fame. Uh, they tour in Germany, Austria, and a few other Europe European countries. And they just released an album as well, and they were touring in the Netherlands during the scan. And the third artist uh, we looked at is uh, a Dutch urban artist, Mr. Props. Um, his career is currently moving fast. Uh, during the scan, a remix of his song Waves reached the number one position in the UK charts. Uh, so also a lot going on uh, with, uh, with Mr. Props. Um, so what we actually did, um, in our first scan we looked at the overall online presence. So we looked at every platform that these artists were on. and. Uh, in the second scan, which we did a week later, um, we looked at if anything had changed. And based on the second scan, we selected a few platforms on which these artists appear to be the most active. Um, so first, we looked at their websites. 
and um, we discovered that only Epica has integrated social media sites uh, into their website. So when you uh, go to the website of Epica and they post uh, news, news items, um, fans and, and internet users uh, immediately can share uh, these posts on Facebook or Twitter and um, uh, they can react on the website itself. Uh, so it's quite an, an interactive uh, website and the other, uh, the other acts uh, didn't have that. You can email them or sign the guest book, but they didn't have uh, uh, social media integrated in the website. So um, we also looked at some social media sites, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus and Instagram and some online streaming services, uh, YouTube, Spotify and Last.fm. Well, I'll talk you through some uh, numbers now. Um, in the first box, we see the four social media sites uh, in the columns, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and Instagram. And I divided the columns into two columns, week one, which was the first scan, and week two was the second scan. Um, and in the rows, we can see the artists. I have to say, for Epica and I am Oak, uh, the second scan was one week later, but for Mr. Props, it was one month later, so we can't really compare the numbers, unfortunately, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you an idea about how it works. Um, well, when we look at Facebook, we see huge differences between different artists. Uh, uh, when we look at Epica, um, we see that they have uh, over 2 million uh, followers on Facebook, of over uh, uh, 2 million likes of, uh, of the page, and they had almost 4,000 new followers in one week. So. Um, yeah, because they had their album, they had just released a new album, so they were really, uh, they made extensive use of, uh, of Facebook at that time. So, um, when we look at I Am Oak, we see uh, different f uh, numbers. It's a modest online presence, less than 10,000 likes, only uh, 56 new likes in one week. And uh, when we look at Mr. Props, uh, significantly less followers on Facebook than uh, Epica, uh, maybe because he's still upcoming. Uh, but he grows, uh, his popularity grows quickly, uh, over 20,000 new likes in one month. Um, when we look at Twitter, we see uh, kind of the same movement. Uh, Epica uh, has the most followers, but only 289 new followers in one week. And Mr. Props has over 18,000 new followers in one month. Um, when we look at I Am Oak, he, uh, uh, this artist has 286 uh, followers. Uh, but it's uh, interesting to tell because uh, he has a Twitter account, but he doesn't tweet. He has one tweet and it says, I'm never going to tweet here, go to the Twitter account of my label. And he still has 286 followers and one new one uh, uh, one week later. Um, well, Google Plus, uh, as you can see, uh, in comparison to Facebook and Twitter, it's not much, there's less going on. Uh, I am Oak isn't on Google Plus, and uh, Epica and Mr. Probs have uh, less followers on Google Plus than they have on Facebook and Twitter. And the last uh, of the social media sites is uh, Instagram. Uh, I am Oak isn't on Instagram, uh, and there's a big difference between Mr. Probs and Epica. Mr. Probs is far more popular on Instagram um, and, and had almost two and a half thousand new followers in one month. So what we can see here is we can't draw any conclusions really, but uh, that different artists and maybe in different genres uh, uh, use different platforms to uh, interact with their fans. And uh, there are also bands that don't have much online presence like I Am Oak, so maybe they have different business models or different ways to interact with their fans. Um, well, we did the same for... Uh, uh, the streaming uh, streaming uh, services, YouTube, Spotify, and Last.fm, and here we see also the same kind of uh, uh, movements. Epica is the most popular, has the most followers, uh, but Mr. Props is growing very fast. Uh, over 10,000 new followers on YouTube in one month, uh, and over 16,000 new followers on Spotify. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the number of followers of Epica and I Am Oak weren't included in this scan. They are on Spotify, but we didn't get the numbers, so it's empty in these boxes. And, um, well, I Am Oak is not on Last.fm, and uh, Mr. Props, this is kind of interesting because he has over 160,000 new listeners in one month, which is quite extensive. Um, so that's interesting. So. 
uh, in a way he's very uh, he's become very popular on last fm well we also looked uh, at the number of single views or visits uh, in comparison to other platforms we, we you can see uh, you can see that on all platforms you just google plus youtube and last fm um, in comparison to other platforms the exposure on google plus is modest again um, when we look at the the numbers on on youtube uh, that's quite a lot more. Um, when we look at YouTube, Mr. Props has the highest amount of views and is 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 growing fast as well. Uh, it's uh, it's three times more than uh, than Epica, and this is about views uh, of the profile. So not the views of the videos, but the profile of the artist. Um, what can we see here? Uh, well, Mr. Probs, uh, over 5 million views in one month, uh, compared to 35,000 new views for Epica and almost 5,000 for I Am Oak. So I Am Oak is also on YouTube. Uh, I had to say that I Am Oak is on YouTube, but they don't have their own YouTube channel. It's the channel of the label again. So the label is doing the most of the work when, uh, when it comes to online presence. And the same goes for Last FM. Uh, Epica has the most single listens, uh, but Mr. Props is growing very fast. Uh, we also looked at uh, what the artists did online to raise their exposure and engagement uh, of their followers by uh, counting the new posts they put online uh, during one week. So uh, you have to put on new content uh, online to, to generate this exposure and uh, engagement. Uh, and when we look at Epica, we see that they had uh, 70 new posts in one week uh, on Facebook, seven on Twitter, uh, four on Instagram, four pictures on Instagram, and one new video uploaded on YouTube. I Am Oak had only two new posts on Facebook, and Mr. Probs had eight uh, new posts on Facebook, 23 on Twitter, and uh, nine pictures on Instagram uploaded. Um, well, what can we do with this? Um, the, to experiment with, me with measuring engagement, we looked at the last three posts of Epica uh, and how people responded to them on the level of the conversation rate, applause rate, and amplification rate. Um, so, and this is interesting because uh, here we look at fans uh, and internet users, users actually doing something and interacting with the content that has been posted. Um, so. We tried to uh, uh, well, we we, uh, we collected this, this data uh, for Epica and the last three posts they posted during the scan. Um, what we can see is on Facebook uh, the conversation rate, which is uh, the amount of replies or, or reactions on a post. On all three posts, there were reactions: 16 for the first one, 93 for the second post, and 21 for the third post. And uh, the applause rate is uh, uh, the number of likes they had, um, which were uh, uh, more. <laughs> post one, uh, over 2,000 likes. Post two, over 4,000 likes. Post three, over 500 likes. And the amplification rate, which uh, uh, means the number of shares. Uh, the first post, uh, 142 uh, shares. Post two, 322. And the third post, 63, 63 times uh, has been shared and uh, what we can see here is that uh, the second post uh, clearly had something valuable to share because there were a lot of reactions, a lot of likes and a lot of shares. Uh, so uh, I believe it was something with, this, with the tour schedule so it was uh, uh, the information was uh, valuable to the fans. Um, when we look at Twitter we can see the same, there were no reactions on the, uh, on the tweets uh, but they have been favorited and shared, and on Instagram, reactions on the pictures, and uh, all pictures were uh, uh, liked uh, slightly over a thousand times. Um, the last one is quite interesting. They had a, a video uh, uploaded on YouTube, and um, there were over 5,000 reactions to that video. So clearly there was something, there was something in that video people wanted to talk about. Uh, because there were only 464 uh, uh, plus ones um, and 5,000 reactions, so that's that's quite a lot, and it's been shared 44 times. So uh, people react different to different kinds of posts or content. 
Well, um, this was just the first scan uh, to explore what we can do with uh, publicly available data. Uh, we can't draw any conclusions yet, but it has given us some insights uh, on how online presence evolves and can be measured. And um, to end this part of the presentation, I'd like to give two examples of websites uh, on which uh, online reputation is measured. And the first one is rankings. Yes. Um, rankings measures online reputation of brands and artists. And so we can see here a list of Dutch artists. Um, and they do that uh, through um, measuring exposure, uh, Twitter followers and Facebook followers. Uh, so we can see Armin van Buren is number one, Afrojack is number two. Um, so the exposure through Facebook and Twitter, uh, but also uh, the influence. So the uh, here the average number of brand mentions per day measured measured over the last seven days. So uh, what's the buzz around uh, an artist? Um, and they also look at the cloud score, and the cloud score is the second. Um, uh, does it? Yes. Yes, um, CloudScore is the second uh, uh, website I wanted to show. And the CloudScore is a number between one and a hundred that represents the influence of an artist or a person. So we can see here um, when it uh, will load, we can't see the cloud scores, but Barack Obama has 99, but Justin Bieber has 92, a cloud score of 92. Um, and um, the cloud score represents the influence of an artist, as we can see here. And what is influence? They define this as uh, when you share something on social media or in real life and people respond, they call that influence. And uh, they measure this by um, looking at different networks and what's going on there. So likes, comments, wall posts, friends on Facebook, Twitter followers, retweets, mentions, Instagram, Google+, uh, LinkedIn, and a few other platforms. Uh, and they add this up and they come to a number between one and 100 and then that's your cloud score and that's uh, your amount of influence you have online. So um, with this uh, example, I'd like to end this part of the presentation and invite Coach back on stage. Thank you. We got time for questions later. Um, let me go back to the presentation. Okay, um, as you saw uh, in the overview of the study, uh, we are now also conducting interviews with experts and uh, try to uh, get some managers and musicians involved as well. Uh, some of the people we already spoke about and were also highly involved in the study. Uh, this is Evelyn van der Steen. Uh, she used to work for Armada. Uh, which is uh, uh, the company uh, that was co-founded by Armin van Buren. Uh, she now started her own uh, online strategy company and she's also working uh, some projects in New Zealand. Um, another one uh, I spoke to is Andy Sondervan. He's the new business development at uh, Buma Stemra, which is the Collecting uh, Rights Society in the Netherlands. And uh, Dennis Duland, who is the person behind the rankings website we just saw. Uh, he used to work at IDNT, a dance uh, concert promoter, but they also had their own radio station, uh, a publishing company, a record company. Um, I just want to share with you a couple of inter in interview quotes. And um, yeah, let me see what's best. I, I will just read them out because uh, then it makes sense. And I've also uh, made a little, uh, uh, made them into little one-liners there. So it used to be only the majors owning everything and having the biggest presence, but that is changing. Now more and more artists and consumers find their way into a niche, and that niche is becoming more popular. So in a way, uh, uh, this was me, uh, in that sense the long tail is proving to be true after all. Uh, and I said this after all because uh, there is quite a lot of people saying, yeah, the long tail is nice theory, but it doesn't work. Uh, she said, yes, I do think so. It's not new. Years ago we said, okay, we'll upload it ourselves to Bandcamp and we have to pay uh, per track. We have them pay per track. Uh, but what is changing now is that the power of the niche as a competitor of the major labels, that you have to create presence on Spotify or SoundCloud. 
So basically, th this leads me to the following. Online interaction with consumers make niche market music able to compete with major labels. And this is also something that we can discuss about later if you want to react. Uh, a couple of other quotes and one-liners. Uh, but to be ahead of the trend, you need a couple of people within your company that are not afraid to try out new things. Or at least who continuously mon monitor developments to see if it could be something that could work. Or something they could get involved with or react to. So, music companies, but musicians at the same time, they should not be afraid, afraid to try out new things. Um, on the other hand, this is uh, the, the continuation of the same uh, interview uh, quote. On the other hand, I'm aware that a lot of these companies, and she talked about media companies in general, they are mega organizations with big departments who just do their day-to-day -day business. And I noticed that within this kind of non-flexible companies, there's people sitting in decision-making positions who are middle-aged men. I believe that it's important to constantly improve your organization by hiring young people who know what's happening. So, there you go, hiring young people might help in finding out what's hot and what's not. Um, from a different interview, this information, and we talked about information from social media users, uh, so really the back end of all the different platforms that we saw, uh, provides insights into your customer or fans. And this knowledge, in a way, is goodwill of your company. If I have this knowledge and I can use this to sell something, for example, I provide a brand access to a segment of my followers, this means that the relationship I have becomes a real value. In this way, you can valorize your network. So you can use the data from network users, so followers, fans, likes, to provide insights in who they are. This information can be monetized. And uh, an example that, uh, that's been used a lot in the Netherlands is Armin van Buren, uh, who uh, now partnered with KLM, uh, the airlines of the Netherlands, but also Heineken, the beer company. Uh, he has how many followers on, uh, uh, on Facebook? Over six million, something like that? Or eight million even? A lot, anyway. So at that point in time, it becomes really interesting for big companies to see if they can partner up with someone who's really into a, a, an interesting segment of the audience that they otherwise would not be able to reach uh, that quickly. But, he also says, uh, this works for a couple of big fish, but for the smaller artists, it doesn't work that way. Because, of course, if you have like 600 likes, it's not very likely that someone like KLM is going to, going to will to talk to you, to partner up. Um, it, and talking about social media, is not the business model. You can use social media to create a business model, but it actually is relationship management with your fans. And how they, and here we refer to artists, are using this relationship uh, to make money is the next step. So instead of saying social media is a business model, it's all about relationship ma management. Deals, and uh, in this uh, uh, part of the interview we talked about uh, deals with uh, record labels. Deals are now only being made after you already have something like 200 million views on YouTube. Uh, labels only pick up new artists if the artists have already done their work. And with done their work, he was referring to the fact that they already, without the help of some sort of intermediary, they already uh, build up online presence. It is a good way for artists to present their own quality, meaning that if you already can show that you have a following, that means that something is going on there. It is more and more the audience who decides what they want to pay you. So by using social media and building an online presence, starting musicians can build their own, so to say, business case um, and prove that there is a market for what they are doing. Okay, and this is uh, 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 Dennis talking. Previous experiences in the dance music industry taught me to rethink the business model of the entertainment industry. One of my claims is that content is a relationship. And if you have a relationship, you have information. From that information, you can start looking what the possible business models could be. And this, here he was reacting to, uh, to, the, uh, to the model that I showed earlier about all the different business models there are. He said, it all comes down to this one relationship that you have. You're a musician, you make music, you make interesting content. There is an audience for that content. 
that means there is a relationship and that relationship is the basis of every uh, business model. So the music industry is not a content industry, it's a relationship industry. Okay, well, hopefully uh, these remarks uh, made from the interviews uh, are interesting for you to respond to, or maybe you want to add something. Uh, as I said earlier, it's ongoing research, so I'm really interested in hearing uh, your experiences as well, so please share your story. Um, also, maybe I, I put down a couple of questions that you might uh, uh, use as leads to say something. So what are you missing in your business? Uh, if you're using social media, what do you really need to know? What do you need to know to do your business, etc.? So I open up the floor for any questions, remarks, experiences. No one? <laughs> it's Friday afternoon, right? Okay. Well, okay. Oh, yeah. Hi, my name is Diego. Um, me and my brother play in a band uh, at a bar here in Berlin, and we actually don't have a like any. We don't have a Facebook page. We don't have a Twitter account. We don't have an Instagram. But we do like uh, we see how how that can really affect your music business. Cause every time we play and we finish the the gig. People come to us and, and they ask us like, uh, do you have a Facebook page? Do you have a YouTube channel? And we all, we're always like, no, we don't have. You guys should have a like. People expect you to have a uh, some sort of channel where you can communicate to your to. Your, so we end up losing those uh, th that fan base, and we we uh, yeah, like it, it, it's. Uh, I think it's a really important tool that you have to take advantage of so that you can uh, stay close to your, your the guys that ultimately get you further in your career so I think it's I think it's a nice the presentation was really helpful for the yeah well, that's, that's great to hear when are you starting your Facebook profile tonight <laughs> all right excellent so here you go. Um, to me, I mean, well, I'm a promoter sometimes and a PR person, but more like kind of hobby-ish. And I know a lot of musicians, and and then they said me like, yeah, and this is my Facebook page, and then I go on this Facebook page and try to look for music, and I don't find it. Doo -doo. So to me, it's more helpful to have a SoundCloud or a Bandcamp page because there's directly the play button. I don't have to like look at plenty of buttons and menu points, I really wanted to have it easy when I, I'm going to book someone or want to know what this person is doing. So yeah, get a YouTube channel or a SoundCloud or a Bandcamp page. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, of course, we didn't uh, look here into all of the platforms because some platforms, they also don't show any metrics at all. So uh, I'm not too familiar with, with whether SoundCloud says how many views or, or plays you have, etc. But I mean, it's something we can uh, look into as well, but we uh, now for this pilot study, we really wanted to uh, look at the, the most important flat platforms that there are. So, okay. Any other thoughts, ideas? Yeah? That's my coming. Hello, I'm um, Khalil. Uh, we, uh, we work a little bit on social media. Um, in your methodology, do you, do you plan to to, to try to find out some uh, metric for the value of a customer or for a customer of a fan or whatever it is. Is it the final objective to, to find the kind of monetary value of... So, do you think there are some... Di well, it's just, I think, that there are some differences between uh, music genre, no? Uh, and it's not directly related to the number of likes, followers, etc. I'm thinking about or maybe contemporary music, or classical music, etc., etc. So, so how can you do this? Because you don't have access to revenue. To how do you plan to do yeah, this? Yeah. That's complicated yeah, yeah. because yeah. we, we, well, we well, see it very shady things. We have followers, we have likes, but yeah. it's like a likes has no value per se. So. Yeah, 
So basically, what you're saying, if you have follow, uh, followers on on uh, on uh, YouTube or or Facebook, it doesn't re really represent any monetary value in itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. In an absolute sense, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I mean, what we talked about today, because I mean, we only had a limited time, of course, and it's a rather big study. Uh, we do look into uh, partnerships with uh, uh, YouTube and uh, Spotify, and uh, Spotify already said that they're interested in working together with us. Um, so what we want to do, because Buma Stemra, uh, the collecting societies, they do have the numbers, but they are not allowed to give it to us as researchers, of course, because it's, uh, uh, well, they, they cannot do it. It's part of the relationship they have, uh, they have with the copyright owners. But once we have uh, um, permission by these platforms to do so, we can be able to show on a, on a, a country level uh, how much money is coming in through uh, uh, all of these different platforms. So not on the artist level, because that's not really what we're interested in, but we do want to know Okay, so you got recordings or you got streams, how much money is actually coming in from outside of the Netherlands for Dutch copyright owners. So we are looking into that as well. But it's really hard, as you say, I mean, we don't have access to the backside of uh, social media, so it's really hard for us to uh, estimate some sort of conversion rate. But as we do see that uh, uh, the basis of uh, 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 the financial value is also the relationship management, um, so what's going on on Facebook does relate uh, in one way or another to some sort of conversion rate. So that can be a uh, concert visit, that can be sales of recordings, etc., etc. So we do want to have some sort of measurement to see what's going on online in terms of online presence. I don't know if that answers your question, but... <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. To continue, I mean, uh, we do want to, as I said, we do want to have a case study of a couple of interesting artists, and we, don't, we do want to see if it's possible to get the managers or even the musicians themselves to, uh, to work with us and present us their data as sort of goodwill to see. Uh, if, so if you are an individual musician, what do you do and how much money is coming in? Anyone else want to add something? Okay, well then, there's two more things I want to say. As I said, it's ongoing research, so more to follow. Uh, again, if you have any further questions, we're sticking around here. Uh, if you want to get in touch, you can also contact us via our email addresses. Uh, I want to thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay here in Berlin. <laughs>